This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Please sure to contact them for all of your travel needs to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and all the other Disney vacation spots. Email them at CaminoCoreWeekly at FairyGodmotherTravel.com and tell them we sent you. Hello, and welcome to CommuniCore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And it's our 160th episode spectacular. Yay! Wow, that's a lot. We really don't have a spectacular planned out for this one. I just, (laughs) I had nothing else to say, and I figured, why not? Well, the question is, did you wave your arms in the air like a Muppet? You know me way too well. That's what I was like. (laughs) <laughs> oh man we've been friends just, for too long guys yeah, i could just see it there well at least 160 episodes yeah yeah so it's, we, we we can't say anything more about it because we'll get in trouble oh man <laughs> we should probably just start the episode now that i made a fool out of myself <laughs> and nobody saw well, except for you clear across the country exactly exactly it's time for disney history Resting in glorious Long Beach Harbor is the majestic RMS Queen Mary, a colossal ship that was bigger, faster, and more powerful than than the Titanic because they had the technology. The ship began her life when her first keel plate was laid in 1930 by the Cunard White Star Company in Scotland, but the depression actually held up her construction and she didn't make her maiden voyage until May 27, 1936. During the 30s and the 40s, ocean liners were uh, top-of-the-line travel for people with lots of money. Uh, For three years, this grand ocean liner hosted the world's rich and famous across the Atlantic, including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Clark Gable, Sir Winston Churchill, and even Walt Disney. Uh, Considered by the upper class to be the only civilized way to travel, she even held the record for the fastest ever North Atlantic crossing. However, in 1939, World War II broke out, and the Queen became known as the Grey Ghost. It was uh, painted completely gray and used as a troop ship uh, to transport troops across the ocean. Her capacity was increased from 2,410 to 5,500. And by the end of World War II, the ship had carried more than 800,000 troops, traveled more than 600,000 miles, and played a significant role in virtually every major Allied campaign. She survived a collision at sea, set the record for carrying the most people ever on a floating vessel at 16,683, and participated in the D-Day invasion. After the war, she was refurbished and began her elegant cruises again in July 1947. However, by the early 1960s, transatlantic cruises were, you know, falling out of fashion due to air travel finally becoming more affordable. You could travel from New York to Paris in 16 hours via air, as opposed to the five days aboard a ship. So in 1967, the Queen Mary was withdrawn from service after more than 1,000 transatlantic crossings and was sold for $3.45 million to the city of Long Beach, California, for use as a maritime museum and hotel. She was permanently docked and soon became the luxury hotel that she is today. Now, now that the history lesson is out of the way, I bet you're asking, just what does the Queen Mary have to do with Disney history? Hmm, so just what does the Queen Mary have to do with Disney history? I am so glad you asked that question, George, because it wasn't rhetorical. Now, during the (laughs) 70s and the early 80s, the Queen was home to many different people. Uh, Jacques Cousteau, he actually tried to showcase some of his exhibits aboard the ship. Um, The Hyatt Corporation, they even attempted to run a hotel using the original staterooms. However, Nothing was successful, and they all closed shortly into the 1980s. And not too long after that, Jack Rather, who had partnered with Walt Disney to open the Disneyland Hotel in 1955, signed a 66-year lease with the city of Long Beach to operate the Queen Mary. When Jack passed away in 1988, Disney bought out his company, the Rather Corporation, which still owned and operated the Disneyland Hotel. 
and as part of the deal, Disney also assumed management of the Queen Mary. Much like they do with any new venture, Disney created a uh, subsidiary company called WCO Port Properties to oversee the lease. And to help promote the new acqu acquisition, Disney created one of their uh, patented year-long events to try to bring people in to see the Queen Mary and the Spruce Goose, which they also acquired as part of the lease deal. And this event was called the Voyage to 1939. Wow, so it wasn't the year of a million or so staterooms? Nope, but it could have been. It could have been. It could have been. Okay. So the actual name of the celebration, the Voyage to 1939, focused on the Queen Mary's last transatlantic voyage before she became a World War II transport ship. Disney recreated the era on the ship as only Disney could. It was like walking into a time warp, essentially, uh, you know, with cast members roaming the ship in period costumes and interacting with guests in the personas of 1939 passengers. They had big bands come aboard and play the popular music of the day, and a special club, Club 39, was created to showcase the popular nightclubs of the era. They even put on this gigantic car show uh, featuring many luxurious examples of models from 1939. And speaking of models, yeah. beautiful girls in period swimwear showed off the cars, which were then auctioned off to the general public. Uh, and then to add even more to the offerings, an air show took place overhead with Captain Cloud and the Royal Flying Circus performing death-defying acts that could be seen all around Long Beach. And outside on the docks, there was even an English carnival uh, that had it was complete with in authentic English food and uh, drinks as well. So we have to say that again. Captain Cloud and the Royal Flying Circus. I love that name. Only Disney. That's a band um, name. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so to further add to the celebration, the Queen Mary herself was restored to her former glory, so she looked as good, if not better, than she did in 1939. The state rooms were refurbished and opened to the public as a hotel. Harrods, the famous London department store, established its first American location aboard the Queen Mary. Prince Michael of Kent, the grandson of the real Queen Mary of England, for whom the ship was named, dedicated the new store. Although the Voyage to 1939 promotion was an initial success for Disney, the overall lease was not. Uh, it was kind of a failure. Everyone who bought tickets for Disneyland at the time also received free admission to the Queen Mary and the Spruce Goose, uh, but most guests didn't actually make the trip to Long Beach. Uh, and in all fairness to them, it wasn't like it was just a, a short walk away. It takes like a good 30 minutes uh, in the car on a good traffic day to actually get there, so I kind of don't blame them. Yeah, and then you gotta watch out for hop-ons, too. Yes, plenty of hop-ons. Okay, so throughout this entire time, uh, the late 1980s and early 1990s, Disney struggled with the Queen Mary financially. In addition to the Voyage of 1939 promotion, the rumor was they wanted to turn the entire area into Port Disney, a huge planned resort on the docks next to the ship. It would have included a theme park uh, known as Disney Sea, themed around the world's oceans. However, several rumors persist that the plans were false and were only being used as a bargaining chip to convince the city of Anaheim to allow them to build Disney's California Adventure. Either way, the Disney Sea concept was recycled almost a decade later when uh, Disney opened Tokyo Disney Sea with an ocean liner that really resembles the Queen Mary quite a bit as its centerpiece. Uh, but back in Long Beach in 1992, Disney opted out of the lease with Long Beach and the property went back to the city. And even though we never got a Disney theme park out of it, we did get a pretty amazing promotion that celebrated the Queen Mary's history. You know, though Disney has nothing to do with it any longer, the Queen Mary is still an amazing place to visit and stay. Yes, you can stay overnight on the ship and enjoy many of the same luxuries passengers did during the ship's heyday. And you can even go on ghost tours, but that's a story for another time, because George does not like that stuff. Wow, I was about to say you got this turned into another haunt, and I'm we're sorry, in January. Man. Sorry, you know, cadets, you, you and I will talk about this later when George is <laughs> around, okay? When he's not looking, okay. we'll talk, okay? All right, cool, call me. So if, if you had any experiences with the Queen Mary uh, during any of its time, <laughs> let, give us a call on the GOAT line and let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Call us at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd, he's a, nerd. He's a geek, he's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is The Lost Notebook, 
Herman Schulteis and the Secrets of Walt Disney's Movie Magic by John Canemaker. And I had to say that slow to make sure I said Herman's last name right. Schulteis? Uh, yes, Schulteis. Wow, Schultes? Yes, that's pretty good. Um, this is a massive book. Weighs 5.6 pounds. It is Sidebar, huge. George literally just looked at how, mu how much the book weighed. Yes, I had he to needed look to it. be very accurate. It's so large it will not fit on my A4 size scanner to get a good scan of the cover. But the book is awesome, even though it's expensive. $75, brand new. Um, it's really, really, really cool. Okay, um, a little bit about the book. It's, I, I heard about it last year, just recently got my copy. And it's one of those books where it's hard to realize how monumental it's going to be, even before you crack the spine. Um, I, I'd avoided all reviews of the book, but you know when you read hundreds of books or of blogs every week, not books, I wish, uh, you're bound to run into people talking about things you're trying to avoid. And The Lost Notebook was an instantaneous hit with animation and Disney studio columnists and historians. Uh, it was hard to miss the articles in which they gushed about this book, and it, it is written by the inimitable, <laughs> inimitable, I love that word, John K. Maker. And it's based on the notebook of a Disney employee from the late 1930s. I've read a lot of books about the studios and never ran across the name Schulteis. So I wasn't sure what to expect, especially with a book with this much hype as well. Uh, the story of the notebook itself came into possession and how it came into possession of the Walt Disney Family Museum. They own the notebook and they worked with Kane Maker and the publisher to put this amazing book together. How the notebook came into the Walt Disney Family Museum's possession is really kind of interesting. It's got some twists and some turns in it, and it makes it adds a lot to the narrative. It's uh, an interesting book that almost is hard to describe because it's a gentleman who worked at the studios only for 1939 and 1940, and not the whole time. And he basically created a notebook that detailed a lot of the special effects and how they did them in some of the animated movies like Dumbo and Fantasia and Pinocchio with a lot of detail about how they made Fantasia itself. Uh, what I loved about the book, uh, besides getting a look at how the studio really worked during that time period for a lot of things they did, was how a lot of this movie magic was actually lost. And until they found his notebooks in this in the house they lived in, some of the things were lost to history and they didn't know how they were done. And they've reproduced this notebook as is. The, the first section of the book itself is a biographical look at Schulteis and his wife um, with a lot of the pages of the notebook highlighted and some of the 5,000 photographs that he took in the 1930s and the 1940s of Los Angeles, which are now at the Los Angeles Public Library. Uh, as I mentioned, the book is huge. It's uh, larger than 11 by 17 than fitting on my scanner. And it clocks in at 292 pages because they reproduce the notebook uh, in, in full scale, in regular size. Um, the book at times was really incredibly dense. Uh, things I did not understand. More than just f-stops on the camera and how they made special effects and certain things they did. Uh, there were a lot of intense things in the book. A lot of and somebody, film terms, you mean? Yes, so. film terms, things like that. Somebody that might go to a college of art or film or might work enjoy this. Or work in one might enjoy with Fair enough. Especially for weightlifting. Um, <laughs> no, that part's not applicable the, to me. Exactly. Uh, there were other parts <laughs> of the book that were really, really charming. Um, uh, during the filming of The Reluctant Dragon, which is covered in this book, Schulteis took a lot of behind-the-scenes photos, and there are over 50 photos alone of Francis Gifford, who is that really cute young starlet who eventually keeps meeting in the film in the different departments. The voice of the um, train. The voice of the train. She was in the ink and paint department. And uh, a little secret, almost everything that was filmed interior, except for the multiplane, wasn't actually filmed in the real rooms. They what? Built on, they built them on the stage, the sound stages. I don't believe it. Yeah, anyway. Um, there, there, are, there are parts in the book where he goes for three pages about a hippo at the zoo that he photographed for, Fanta for Fantasia. So you get these really odd juxtapositions between how serious he was about this and, and how much in love he was with himself 
And that's another part of the story that comes across. I don't want to ruin that you guys have to check out. Um, the, the, the story of uh, Schulte's, <clears throat> got choked up, of, of Herman's life, we'll go to his first name, was very tragic for someone that was so promising. You really come to understand how his uh, braggadocio and his German heritage, you know, at the very beginnings of World War II, really shaped his very short-lived career at Disney and may have stopped his employment elsewhere. So it's a very interesting look at it. Um, after reading the book, which obviously I highly recommend, um, there's one photo in the book which I've tweeted and put on Facebook. That's an image we've all seen of the, the 2719 Hyperion Studios where an artist or an animator labeled where things were. That to me was fantastic. There's some layouts of the studios that are in the book, a lot of behind the scenes. But y you understand now why everybody was excited about it, especially John Canemaker, the author, who's an animation historian, film critic, professor at the Tisch School of Animation. Um, just for seeing how the studios were in 1939 and 1940. And it, it really surprised me at how many people that he had photographed in his daily work that are no longer known. And not many people would have known him outside of this book and what they had done. So it was a little odd to think of the hundreds, if not the thousands of employees that worked at Disney to make all these films. And in some cases, we don't even know the names of them. But anyway, I don't want to get so morose and sad. This book is fantastic. I highly recommend it. It is expensive. It is heavy. It's very large. Um, but I think any fan of the animation from that time period, Fantasia, Pinocchio, Dumbo, The Reluctant Dragon, is going to love this book. Filmmaker, animator, fan of animation, the studios, you're going to love this book as well. And this week's book is The Lost Notebook, Herman Schulteis and the Secrets of Walt Disney's Movie Magic by John K. Maker. Here's another minute that you can't get back. It's the 60 Second Review. So for this 60 second review, I unfortunately did not receive all these wonderful movies, uh, but George did, and I'm a, I'm a little jealous, but I'm excited to hear his review of them. So uh, take it away, George. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Um, we got three new films by Studio Ghibli, and they're not the A-listers. These are the B-listers, so the don't B -team. feel too bad. This is the B-team. Yeah, don't feel too bad. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is Tales from Earthsea which uh, was from first-time director Goro Miyazaki, which is Hayao Miyazaki's son, and it's based on a series of best-selling fantasy titles by Ursula K. Le Guin and inspired by the manga Shuna's Journey by Hayao Miyazaki. The film was released in Japan in 2006, but wasn't able, uh, was not able to be released in the United States due to a conflict with another television adaptation of the book. Uh, it's got some amazing voiceovers in the cast, including Timothy Dalton, Cheech Marin, and William Dafoe. And they did an excellent job, as usual, of matching the movements of the mouths with the dialogue. Um, a lot of the critics, and including myself, have really panned the film, called it bland. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin even said it's a beautiful film, but it doesn't match my books at all. Uh, you know, we, we did enjoy the film as a family, and we were able to follow the plot fairly easily even though the cultural references may be difficult to understand. Um, some of the scenes were breathtaking, uh, but I was, uh, it just didn't come across as the film that I wanted it to be. Uh, and that was Tales from Earth Sea. Maybe rent it if you want to watch all of them. I had another friend who said him and his wife tried to watch it and he fell asleep in the middle of it. And he's a, he actually visited the Studio Ghibli film in, in Japan. So that says something. Okay, the next film is Palm Poco. And I was glad to get this one on Blu-ray. I'd seen it on DVD before, and I tried to prepare my family for it because it's a little bit odd. Um, but it's basically we meet what's referred to as a, a raccoon tribe living outside of Tokyo. And the raccoons are losing their territory territory by the encroaching city and its growth you know, of Tokyo. And this probably takes place, my guess, is, is in the 60s. The raccoons are actually tanukis, which you might remember from Super Mario Brothers. Heck yes. Eight. So, because he had his tanuki suit. And, but these are actually, tanuki are raccoon dogs that are able to tap into transformative powers, which they then use to play tricks on the humans in order to stop the construction and the 
the building of the uh, the suburban neighborhood. Uh, it, it, it looks at a lot of, uh, it's got a very heavy environmentalism theme as well, which we see in a lot of Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli films. But this film was written and directed by Aiseo Takahata, who is Miyazaki's longtime collaborator. So it's not quite, it, it's still real Studio Ghibli, but it's a little bit more adult, not in a bad way. Um, and it has some very strange cultural moments that might not be understood by most American audiences. Uh, for instance, part of the transformation of the tanuki involves the pouches of the males. Uh, and my 11-year-old and his best friend spent the entire weekend giggling about the pouches, which can sort of give you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, the, the film is really gorgeous. It is beautifully animated, well done. It's a very touching story, and I liked it. I liked it. I think it's something you should watch. Maybe watch it before you share it with the kids, just to make sure it's okay. The last film that they released on Blu-ray is Porco Rosso. Say that again, Porco Rosso. Uh, and it's always been a family favorite in my house because we'd seen it on DVD before. Uh, the movie's about an Italian World War I ex-fighter pilot now living as a bounty hunter, and he chases air pirates in the Adriatic Sea. Uh, like the other Studio Ghibli films, uh, an unusual curse has transformed uh, the main character into an anthropomorphic pig, and he is known to the world as Porco Rosso, which is Italian for red pig. It, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful film, again, like all the Studio Ghibli films, and it has a lot of heart, especially when you see the relationship that Porco and Fio, who's the daughter of the mechanic that Porco uses, when uh, they have to travel together. And it, you really see how he's a man that's looking for redemption and trying to find himself. And the most exciting part of the film is that Susan Egan is in it. Of, I and, knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's you had me at Susan Egan. Basically, uh, there are, there are a lot of action scenes in the in the Blu-ray, and as expected, lots of flying machines because this is a Hayao Miyazaki film. Lots of crazy airplanes and things like that. Uh, it, it's really a great film for someone that's looking for a little more action and comedy. And of the three films, Tales from Earth Sea, Palm Poco, and Porco Rosso. Uh, Porco Rosso, in my, in my family's opinion, is probably the best, followed by Palm Poco for the slightly older crowd. Uh, definitely pick up Porco Rosso and maybe rent the other ones. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. There are several snow globes topping one of the sales displays inside the Radiator Springs Curio Shop in Carsland at Disney California Adventure. And if you look closely, you'll see one of those snow globes actually features Nick, the little snowman from Nome, Alaska. Now who's Nick, you may be asking? Well, he was the star of the 1989 award-winning Pixar short film, Nick Knack. Isn't that incredible? They're just paying a little tribute to some old school Pixar films. It's funny to think of that being old school. <laughs> yeah, 1989. How old was I in 1989? Seven? I don't want to hear it. I was no. probably seven, George. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. We'll suffice it to say I graduated high school. Fair so enough. Fair enough. That's that's all we'll say. Uh, well, we <laughs> wanted to make the announcement for this week's prize winner for the year of a million, million or so limited time cadets man i hope before this year's over you finally get the name to correct. say it right because i keep wanting to throw magic in there no magic and it's not in there i we veto the, the magic i hate no. magic <laughs> no magic it's an illusion michael it's an illusion yes that's the <laughs> second <laughs> reference you've made today <laughs> well we talked about the queen mary oh uh, okay I'm that's three references we there made there wasn't something about a lucille uh, in the man. harbor somewhere um Okay, so just remember to uh, be part of the year of a million or so limited time cadets. We need you to send uh, an email to communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, address, and birthday, because we're sending out some special surprises in addition to the weekly prize. But this week's prize is a Disney Cruise Line prize pack from Fairy Godmother Travel that features towels, coasters, and a few more surprises. And the winner for this week is Wally K from Westland, Michigan. Hooray! So, as you say, congratulations, Wally. We hope you enjoy the prize pack. And take a photo and send it to us. Yes. We'd love to see you with the prizes. Please do. Do it that way. 
Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yes, wherever you're listening to us, be sure to leave us a comment, whether it's on YouTube or on, you know, the, the website, or give us a rating on iTunes. Yeah, those nine-star ratings, don't forget. Nine-star ratings. You need the nine-star ratings. Uh, email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com, whether you want to enter the contest or just tell us how awesome we are. And of course, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. Yep. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imaginerding. He's at Jeff Heimbuck. And give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. Be sure to visit CommunicoreWeekly.com and visit the Communa Store where you can purchase t-shirts like the awesome Ghost Whistle hat box type t-shirt, maybe? Maybe? I thought you were going to do the ghost. I know. Episode. You were setting me up for it. I didn't take the Molly for That's reason. okay. And you can also pick up a copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical, which is the best musical we've ever released. Ever. So far. Ever. So far. Yeah, so far. So far. Uh, and of course, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And we will gladly send you back stickers and your official cadet membership card. That's right. You've got to be an official cadet. You can also visit patreon.com slash Weekly and help support us. We'd really love your uh, support. Yes, please. I said with a question mark. Question mark. (laughs) Well, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Sonic.